Uh, take your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 4, if you would. Open your Bible. I don't have that up on the screen, but I want you to open your Bible anyway to Revelation chapter 4. And uh, we might finish this chapter out today. Um, this is John. Uh, when you think about the people who got to see uh, heaven uh, before they died, um, I can think of Moses. Uh, we know that Ezekiel got to see the throne of God, the chariot of God. Um, Moses saw it and was told to build it according to exactly what he saw. Um, Solomon was given the wisdom to build his temple according to the plans of God in heaven. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up on his throne in Isaiah chapter 6. Um, who else would there be? We know that Paul mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it was either him or someone that he was talking about. The Bible is unclear. Some people have an opinion either way. I don't. I don't know who it was. But he mentions being caught up into the third heaven, hearing unspeakable things and so on. And now we have John who is taken up in the spirit uh, into heaven and he's, he gets to see the throne of God in heaven. And that's going to be done again. Uh, let's see, where is that? I'm going to say, um, let's see here, Revelation, maybe, yeah, 11. Revelation eleven nineteen, and the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in the, his temple the ark of his testament. Now that is not, and we'll get to that probably next year, but anyway, that is not the ark of the covenant that Moses made. It is an ark of a new testament, a new covenant. It is the real one that Moses saw that he copied uh, here on this earth. But the real one is the one seen in Revelation Eleven nineteen. But anyway, Revelation chapter 4, uh, let's pick it up in um, verse 2. And immediately I was in the spirit, behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, or a sardius stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne. This is what Ezekiel saw. In Ezekiel 1, he saw the rainbow. We know what the rainbow represents. It's the likeness of the glory of the Lord. The rainbow represents the token of God's covenant that he will not break. That goes back to Genesis 9. And uh, verse 4, And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. There were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion. This matches what Ezekiel saw. The second beast like a calf. That also matches what Ezekiel saw. Ezekiel said he saw an ox. Well, a baby ox is a calf. So they're seeing the same thing. The third beast had the face of a man. The fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And remember, Ezekiel is seeing it down here on the earth, while John is seeing it up in heaven. And so if you think that there's a discrepancy between what Ezekiel saw, like, and I'll give you an example. In Ezekiel, Ezekiel says that those cherub had four wings. John, however, in verse 8, says they had six wings. Now, is Ezekiel lying? No, we can't believe that because we believe that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and God cannot lie. Well, then did Ezekiel, did Ezekiel originally write down six wings and then a scribe who copied Ezekiel's book make a mistake and write four wings. Well, 
My argument for that would be, number one, the Old Testament scribes were extremely meticulous at copying. They had, I was told that they had some form of numbering system or whatever to ensure that every line that they copied matched the line that they copied from. And if it didn't match, that document that that scribe was working on did not survive. If it had an error on it, that copy was burnt and destroyed. That's why we have so little of the Old Testament and so much of the New Testament Greek text is that in the Old Testament, if it, was, if it had mistakes and errors on it, it was thrown in the fire. So anyway, I won't get into the whole history of Hebrew text, but that's why. So very little possibility that there was a mistake by a later scribe. Plus also, the Bible says that God would preserve every word of his word, including whether or not there was four wings or six wings. So here's what I see. How many wings did they have? Well, at least four. And the total number was six. Again, Ezekiel is only able to see it from the earth. And it's possible that there were things that he could not see. Because he's looking at spiritual things. He's looking at spirits and they are of an entirely different realm than us. But then John is in the spirit and he's in heaven and he's seeing it dead on as it actually is. And he says there's six wings. So I believe both of them. I believe both of them could absolutely be right. Um, then verse 8. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him. And they were full of eyes within. And they rest not. Just think of butterflies. Think of a peacock. What does a peacock have on his feathers? Eyes all around it. God designed that to give us a visual of what is in heaven. And they rest not night, day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord. To receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. And for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, I was looking at that verse last night. I'm not going to get into it right now. I may get into it in a little bit. But I started looking at that and... People often ask themselves, what, what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? Um, I know that having studied the UFO movement for years now, most people in the UFO movement are convinced that an extraterrestrial race, and this, is, this shows up in Every episode of Ancient Aliens, every one of them. Most UFO people, believers believe that an extraterrestrial race seeded mankind here on this earth. They have different stories about it. Some involve the Sumerian accounts of the creation and so on. That the gods who are the extraterrestrials came and they found monkeys and they tweaked their DNA and turned them into humans, uh, which were meant to be the slaves to the ET gods. Okay, which is stupid. But even Francis Crick, who uh, helped discover the shape and the, and the complexity and the makeup of DNA, did not believe in Darwin's version of evolution. He believed and what's called the star seed scenario, that something millions of years ago either deliberately 
or accidentally DNA was planted here on the earth by some extraterrestrial thing. But then you have to ask the question, where did that DNA come from? You have to chase it back all the way to the beginning. There had to be a beginning somewhere. And it's just as easy to say, God wrote it, God made it, God put it here. Because that's exactly what we believe. And God did it deliberately. But because they, don't believe, they only believe certain parts of the Bible, they, won't, they reject the rest of it. They won't believe the biblical account of creation. They won't believe anything like that. And so they're left with this big hole in their thinking of how man got here. And if, and if all we are, if all we are is a slave race to some extraterrestrial force, then what good are we? What purpose do we serve? But it sort of gets into mankind to wonder why he is here. Why, his, why he has knowledge of his own existence. What does it mean in the greater spectrum of things? Where, where did we come from? Where are we going? Why are we here? And this is explained perfectly in Revelation 4.11. For thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. We were created to please God. Not in some, um, not in some mean, malicious way as God is some evil God who likes to see how many people he can destroy and go, <laughs> not like that at all. God, just like my wife and I, had pleasure in our own children who were growing up. And now... In all of our grandchildren, all, every one of them, we find great pleasure in watching our grandchildren grow up and us and our interaction with them. And I got a plaque. I got a plaque for all you grandpas out there. I got a plaque in my office that says, best grandpa in the world. Ha! Try to catch up with me. But I find great pleasure in that, in, in having a family. It brings me great pleasure. And God is the same way. God now has a family and he's creating a bride for his son. And so all things in the creation serve to bring pleasure to God. And then I started asking the question, I wonder what else pleases God and I started I I did not even get I don't think halfway through the scriptures last night but anyway I'll try to get there in a, in a little bit um, let's look at Moses there are let's see one two three there have been three earthly buildings that have represented the temple of God in heaven. The first one we have up on the screen, Exodus 40, verse 17. It came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. And Moses reared up the tabernacle and fastened his sockets and set up the boards thereof and put in the bars thereof and reared up his pillars. And he spread abroad the tent over the tabernacle, put the covering of the tent above upon it as the Lord commanded Moses. And then in verse 34, when Moses got finished putting everything up, here's what happened. Then a cloud covered the tent. But you think about it. When Jesus comes, is he, how's he coming, Jason? In a cloud. How did he come here? In a cloud. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation. And what was it? The glory of the Lord. Well, what did we see here in Revelation 4? A rainbow which Ezekiel 1 says is the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So here we have the glory of the Lord. It filled, this is, watch this. This is, Moses made the tabernacle and when he finished it, God whoosh, came in and he filled that tabernacle. Well, what happened on the day of Pentecost? They heard it 
and they felt it, a rushing mighty wind. Then you find the same thing. First Kings 7. So was ended all the work. This is this, this is this Solomon's temple. All the work that King Solomon made for the house of the Lord. And Solomon brought in the things which David his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and the vessels did he put among the treasures of the house of the Lord. So now he's finished the temple. Look what happens in 1 Kings 8, verse 10. And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place that, here again, the cloud showed up again. Are you getting a picture? The cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord. There it is again. The glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. Whoosh. The glory of the Lord now is in the house of the Lord. This is the second, second building. First one was Moses' tabernacle. This is Solomon's temple. The temple of the Holy Ghost. Look at it. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God? And you're, oh, oh, by the way, let me back up. I don't have this in my notes. Herod's temple. Herod's temple, which was the, th the re, it was the third temple, or excuse me, the second temple after the Babylonian destruction, they came back from Babylon and rebuilt the temple. And then it kind of fell into ruin. And when Herod the king became king, he rehabbed it, added a bunch of stuff to it, and it's called Herod's temple. But it's the, it is the second temple that survives in Jesus' day, and it was referred to as Herod's temple. Did God enter into the temple? Yes. When Jesus went in there. Jesus went into the house of the Lord in the temple and he taught. And what he found in there were the money changers and everything like that. And that's when he overthrew them and chased them out with scourges. And he said, it is written that my house should be called a house of prayer for all people, but you have made it a den of thieves. So even that second temple, God himself entered into it in the form of Jesus Christ. Then we have the temple of the body. Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. You're not in your own. You're not your own. Acts chapter 2. This is the day of Pentecost. This is the temple of God. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And I respectfully say to all of those of a maybe of a church of God or Pentecostal church of God or whatever background who say that the baptism or the infilling of the Holy Ghost comes at some time after salvation. Remember, salvation is your second birth. How does God signify to us when the Holy Ghost enters us as born again Christians? He does it by way of our birth. At the moment of our birth, the first thing we do. They used to spank babies. They used to hold them up upside down so that mucus could run out of their lungs or water or whatever fluid. And they used to give them a swat on the behind to get the breathing started. They don't do that anymore. They just bring the baby out and suck whatever is in there and lay it on the mother's bosom and all of a sudden, the baby starts crying. Life just kicks in. It doesn't need a doctor's help anymore. That's what doctors do. And all of a sudden, life just kicks in. And that child, now that it's been born, for some reason, that child or its DNA knows it's no longer in the womb receiving oxygen 
from the mother. It needs it a different way. And now the Holy Ghost, the air, the breath enters into that child and it fills the house of the Lord in every born baby. Somebody online, whoever say amen. But that's how it's done. Praise the Lord. Then we have the four and 20 elders sitting clothed in white. That's your 24 ribs, 12 on this side. 12 on this side. Now, think about your Bible for a minute. In the Old Testament, you had 12 tribes. New Testament, 12 apostles. I pondered this one time about, okay, I got 12 ribs here, 12 ribs here. Which 12 ribs represent the apostles and which side represents Israel? And I thought about it long and hard. And I believe that on the right hand, the Bible talks about the right hand of God. There's power in the right hand of God. The book is in the right hand of God. We are people of the book. The apostles finished the book of God. And I think the Gentile church is represented by the 12 ribs on the right side. Where does that leave Israel? On the left. However, take a look up there on the screen or just feel. Where is your heart? Just slightly to the left. On the left side. In fact, there is a hollow space in your left lung to make room for the heart. And I want to show you this. Right side, 12 apostles, Gentile church. Left side, 12 tribes, Israel. And that's where your heart is. Just in the middle, over to the left. And I'm going to show you some scripture that I think backs that up. The law said that a breastplate was to be made for Aaron, the high priest. And Exodus 28 says, Thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. After the work of the ephod, thou shalt make it. Gold of blue and purple and of scarlet and fine twine linen shalt thou make it. And Aaron was to put that breastplate on every day, every year on the Day of Atonement. Aaron would put that breastplate on. And on one day of the year, he takes the breastplate wearing it. And he goes into the most holy place with the blood. And he sprinkles the blood on the north part of the Ark of the Covenant seven times. And then he comes out. And that's to atone for the sins of Israel for one year only. That's a picture of Christ. Now, Exodus 28, 21 says, The stones shall be with the names of the children of Israel, according to their names, like the engravings of a signet. Every one with his name shall they be according to the twelve tribes. So all twelve stones had the names on here. Judah, Ephraim, Manasseh, Gad, Dan, so on and so on and so on. All twelve. And then here's the reason for it. Verse 29. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. Now we use that phrase, don't we? Hey, you've been on my heart lately. Brother Reg Kelly called me a few weeks ago. He said, Brother Mike, you've just been on my heart lately. I just want to call and encourage you. Tell you I love you. Tell you I'm praying for you. Keep fighting, Mike. Keep, keep in the battle. We need you. Man, that blessed my heart. A good friend of our church, the man who put in our sewer system and services it, good godly born-again man, Tim Myers, called me the other day. Mike, he called me while I was out just dealing with, just before I got sick, just dealing with stress. And God laid it on his heart to call me. Mike, he said, I just had you on my mind. I want to call you and tell you I love you. 
How's Brother Sterling? I like Sterling. And I told him how Sterling was doing. And he said, I just, he said, I know you've been through a lot. I've seen some things online. He said, I know your church has been through a lot. And he said, I just want you to know I love you. I'm praying for you. I was on his heart. I, I reached out to Brother Jamie, who just, I mean, here he's going to have this big camp meeting, and he's in the hospital getting a pacemaker. Jamie, you've been on my heart. How you doing? He was there, he was there at the meeting, had his, had his arm in a sling because he can't move his arm. But he's been on my heart. Other people, people in this church have been on my heart all week long, praying for him, hoping things get better for him, hoping this sickness goes away, hoping it doesn't affect people. So Aaron, the high priest, this is really Christ. When Christ was on the cross, he was wearing the breastplate of judgment, of righteousness, whose names was on his heart. When he was on the cross, yes, he died for the whole world, but for the Jew first. In the names of the tribes of Israel, look, let, that he shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart. When he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. That means Christ is still has Israel on his heart. When he comes to earth, was he born a German? Was he born an, an Aryan, Hitler, German? No. Was he born Chinese? No. Was he born Indian? No. Was he born white Caucasian? No. He came as a Jew. Why? The God who is the God over all races, all families, all nations, came to earth as a Jew. Why? For the salvation of Israel. Those names were on his heart when he died on the cross. Man, I love that. Now, got a few minutes left. Let's get into this. I want you to think about what pleases God. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. If you want to, do what I did last night. Get your, and we didn't get home till probably close to, I don't know, by the time we got in and got unloaded, it was about 7 o'clock, 7.30, something like that. And I didn't have these notes in my notes, and I got to looking at verse 11 last night. And I just took out my Bible app and typed in the, the word P-L-E-A-S. And you can put an asterisk there or whatever. So it'll come up with all the forms of the word please, pleasant, pleasure, pleasing. Any form of the word with the word please in it. And I just start looking. Some things bring pleasure to man. Some things bring pleasure to God. Let me give you an example. This I didn't get to because, I mean, I was just rolling in scriptures last night with this. Man, I was getting so much out of it. Turn to Isaiah 53. I'll give you an example. Jason, you ever watch Star Trek? Um, Do you see the, the Star Trek movie? can't remember what number it was where Spock's brother took over the enterprise took it to the center of the galaxy because he was he believed that God was there did you see that one it was like Star Trek 5 it was after the whales one okay but anyway so the the storyline of this Star Trek movie was Spock's got a brother he didn't he nobody knew about they they wrote him in and he believes in this ancient god called Chakari or something like that 
But it's like the God of the Vulcans that they used to believe in thousands of years ago that their logic and intellect don't believe in anymore. But he, he said God called him out of the center of the galaxy. And nobody's ever been to the center of the galaxy because there's a barrier there and they can't get there. But they figured out a way and he steals the Enterprise and Spock and Kirk and Bones are on it. And they finally get to the center of the galaxy and there's this planet there. And they go down to the planet, of course. And uh, there's this ghostly guy, old guy, long white hair, long white mustache, long white beard. You know what everybody thinks God looks like, okay? What, how Michelangelo painted him in the Sistine Chapel. And really he's an alien that got trapped there. But anyway, uh, this God turns angry and starts zapping. He zapped Kirk zapped Spock, zapped his brother, and Bones is like, he's, he's furious. What kind of God are you? I'm a doctor. What kind of God are you? And he said, I don't believe in any God that inflicts pleasure, or that inflicts pain on a man for his own pleasure. And as soon as I heard that, I remembered Isaiah 53. And there's no doubt that was a direct slap in the face to our God. Isaiah 53. Um, let's pick it up, verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Who, who smote Christ? God. Who struck him? God. Who afflicted Christ? God. He was, we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray and have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. And he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. He made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. And look at verse 10. Look at the first sentence of verse 10. Yet it pleased God, pleased the Lord, to bruise him. And as soon as Bones in that movie said, I won't, I won't believe in any God who inflicts pain upon man for his own pleasure. I thought of that. The Holy Ghost said, Mike, that's a slap in my face. But you see, it's not, it's not like what you think. God didn't inflict pain on me. For his pleasure. He didn't inflict pain on Jason here. For his pleasure. To please him. To satisfy the just demands of the law. He wasn't like the gods of other civilizations. Whose sacrifices required human sacrifices. And the most grotesque form. He said, I'm not going to kill man. I'm going to inflict my only begotten son. In other words, I'll do it myself. That God I'll serve. It pleased, see this is what pleases God. It pleased God to bruise Christ because in bruising Christ, we then are brought to redemption and salvation. Let me read some other things that pleases God. For a while we, I'm going to take two minutes. Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. 
You see, you see what I'm getting at now? What pleases God? Well, it pleased God to make us his people. Let me go to the Psalms. Psalm 5, 4. For thou art not a God that hath pleasure in wickedness. Neither shall evil dwell with thee. What doesn't please God? Wickedness. Psalm 40, 13. Be blessed, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. And it does. It does please God to deliver sinners. Psalm 51. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased. Listen. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offerings and the whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Uh, let me read a couple more. The, Psalm 147. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him. Psalm 149. The Lord taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. And, and that's, about, that's as far as I got last night. You take it and run it the rest of the way through script, run it through the prophets, run it through the New Testament. Find out what pleases God. It'll bless you. Father, bless your word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this Sunday school time. I pray, dear God, Lord, that we would be pleasing to you. Thank you for laying the chastisement of our peace upon your only begotten Son. And Father, I'll love you and serve you even if the Trekkies don't. I'll still serve you because I know what you did for me. I know, what you all, I know the salvation you offer to mankind, and it's not grievous to mankind at all. It's a glorious salvation. Father, bless your word today. Bless it in the hearts of these people. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. I'm going to take a few minutes break, get my voice back.